Welcome everyone to our panel discussion of OERs at UWS. We have with us today three wonderful presenters, panelists, as panelists is more appropriate, who will be talking about their experiences here at UWS with using and creating and adopting open educational resources. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, but before we begin, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement statement. In honor of the Ashinaabe people, the original peoples and caretakers of this land, we would like to recognize that the University of Wisconsin-Superior inhabits the land of the Ojibwe people. Please take this moment to honor and celebrate ancestral Ojibwe land and the sacred lands of all indigenous peoples. Right. thank you. So today's discussion, we're going to start with introductions, of course, and then just go into um, a discussion. Whatever the panelists would like to discuss, we'll take questions from the audience. And if things get a little quiet, we do have several questions to put everyone in the hot seat. So, woohoo, ha ha. <laughs> right, so if you'd like to begin. Uh, all right, uh, my name is Josh Stangle. I'm in my fifth year here working at UWS. I'm an assistant professor in the math department. Uh, and I teach a pretty wide variety of courses in the math department. Uh, mostly I run our probability and statistics upper level courses. I teach Math 310, which is like the gateway course for majors into abstract mathematics and mathematical writing. Uh, and I do teach a little bit of computer science uh, as well, intro to programming, things like that. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Riesgraf. I'm also in the math and computer science department. I believe I am approaching my, technically my 11th year here, um, but I believe it's also my fifth year in the math and computer science department. Uh, I mainly teach uh, developmental math classes. Right now we've switched to a co-requisite for a couple of our classes. So I've been teaching some support classes for our gateway math classes, as, as well as um, I've had experience teaching in our 100 level um, freshman level math classes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Chad Volrath. Uh, I teach in the Communicating Arts Department. Um, I teach communication courses in uh, communication theory, uh, persuasion, uh, communication gender, um, and some other ones. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, and uh, I, I guess we probably got here around the same time. I'm, I think I'm in my ninth or tenth year. I, I always forget. Uh, um, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I look forward to your questions. All right. So our first question for the panel, how did you get started teaching with open educational resources? Uh, I can go first. Uh, so first of all, I'll say that everything, everything I say should be taken as an opinion. Uh, I, certainly, <laughs> I certainly think I'm right about everything, but it doesn't mean that I am, and uh, I'm certainly not right for every person. So I think that my experience with open educational resources came mostly from reflecting about how I use textbooks in my courses. Uh, I was having students buy textbooks, as you, as you might, uh, and I would get a lot of reviews that I didn't like, they didn't need them because I don't rely on them very heavily. Uh, I, I refuse to be shackled to the like, way a textbook presents material and kind of do my own thing. When I think of them as like a secondary resource students can use to get really a different treatment of what's going on. Examples worked in a different way. Uh, like a different explanation for why things are true. I don't have to necessarily, I, I, I don't just follow the textbook. It's not the way I teach. And so I realized that having students buy a textbook that they then don't necessarily need at any point. I write my own homeworks. Uh, I like make my own assessments. Uh, was probably not like fair to them, uh, especially like if they paid for it and then just sold it at the end. So I kind of tried to reflect on um, ways that I could avoid that. So now for almost all of my courses, with the exception of intro to programming, uh, I find an open educational resource that I think is suitable, uh, mm -hmm. at least good enough, and I just adopt it. And then I teach the course the way I want. And if the students feel like the open educational resource is not enough of a backbone, I direct them to resources they could buy if they chose to. Uh, but I sort of use the, the textbook or whatever resource I'm using as a as a guide for how to pace the course and how to like move through the material, but then I give my own presentation of how I think it should be interpreted. Uh, other open educational resources I've used when we switched to online discussion, I was like, there's no way I can make like 
10 hours of videos a week. I just don't have time. Uh, so what I did is I just went on, I use Reddit, uh, which is like an online social media forum page. And I just look for open resources on there and read people's reviews. And I found a bunch of YouTube lecture series that were uh, Creative Commons licensed. And I shared those for my students. Uh, I would say they got like half use. Some students used them, some didn't need them, but it gave another resource. A lot of them are like really digestible. You can find, especially in math, you can find like four to five minute clips going through one or two problems. And I embedded a lot of those in our Canvas course. So I think that's my experience so far. I'm just going down. Uh, so I think listening to Josh, some of our reasonings are the same. I think I got to start at one because again, I, I a lot of my experience is in the developmental and the freshman level classes. And I've noticed at first, um, a lot of the math textbooks are outrageously priced and some of the, even the online homework systems, if you're packaging them with the traditional textbook, they're hundreds plus dollars for them. Um, and the student population, if a student came in and they weren't um, having that resource within the first week or really the first day, they were falling behind really quick and then recognizing that that was a pattern of losing a student. Um, so that was maybe where a first indicator of like, what can I do to even like hold off on needing that resource for two weeks? Um, and then to kind of diving in like Josh did, what am I really using that resource for? Uh, the algebra classes that I'm teaching, the open resources, I mean, they provide a lot of diff just different problems. A lot of the times the textbooks I was using was just so that they had problems to try and to practice. And so is there an alternative way that I can develop that? And, and the, the open resources have good practice problems. So it's not like um, they needed to be purchasing that textbook for it. Um, and then, you know, the open resources, uh, also provide maybe a different way of explaining it too. And then I think part of what I liked about the open resources is that I could correct it or adapt it or change it. Um, so I've been doing some of that. But the one thing that I think it was about, I want to say four years ago, maybe five, I did go to, I think it was UW Stout had an e-affordability conference that I was able to attend. And I think that's really then that was around the time I noticed the pattern and wanted to change. And that was really, I don't know, I got a lot of insight that made me feel like it was something I could do and not worry about, um, I don't know, maybe the thing that you were used to, right? It was always get a textbook, have the students have it type of thing. So um, hearing the different experiences and how people were incorporating it, that really just set it up for me to start using them. Uh, hey again, everybody. Uh, I I uh, got started using OERs a few years ago uh, when in a department meeting, uh, we had kind of a brainstorming session uh, around the issue of retention and how to improve student experience uh, on campus. And one of the ideas that came up uh, was, uh, was there any way that we can lower textbook costs? And uh, at the time, uh, I had just become the department coordinator for uh, COM 110, uh, which some of you may have know. Uh, it's a, a university studies or general education course that's taken by almost everybody who comes to the university and, and all of the professors in our department teach that course. And we used to use uh, a textbook that was the most popular textbook in the field for an introduction to communication course. And if my memory serves me correctly, it was like $100, $115, something around there, right? And so if you can imagine, you know, every <laughs> student coming through the university times $115, you know, that's how much was getting spent on that textbook. At this point, I'd never heard of OERs. I didn't know what the acronym stood for. I think I thought the O was online. <laughs> it's a mistake. Um, uh, but as COM 110 director, I, I started looking into, well, are there any alternatives that we can use? And uh, uh, I, I um, started on that project uh, and uh, very luckily uh, found that other people had apparently uh, come across this, or the, had the same sort of thought uh, because there was already uh, a pretty well-developed textbook uh, in production that more or less mirrored the most popular textbook on the field in, in the field in terms of its content and organization. 
And uh, so from there, uh, the job was really getting departmental buy-in to this big switchover because people had obviously uh, been used to using the same textbook for, for years and, uh, and had syllabuses arranged around it, right? And so this was a fairly large change for them. Uh, uh, but everybody was on board with less lower textbook costs for students, right? And, and so it was, it was kind of an easy sell uh, in that way. And it was an easier sell because once they got a look at the textbook, they realized, oh, this is a lot of the same content, right? And, and even the chapters are sort of in the same words. So I got lucky in that sense. But then I got interested in OERs and, 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 uh, and started pursuing it more and, and uh, also attended a, a UW Stout uh, uh, conference on OERs. Uh, and, and UW Stout is doing uh, some amazing things around OERs. In fact, uh, for a really long time, I understand, has folded textbook costs into the price of tuition, mm -hmm. uh, and, which really helps to keep it down for students. Um, and, and so uh, that was my first experience. And I think I had a similar experience like, oh, wow, this world is really big. And <laughs> there's like, and it's legitimate, right? And a lot of people are involved in it and doing interesting stuff. Uh, and so then I, I went to a couple of more conferences uh, on OERs and um, and I guess I'll, I'll stop there. I've, I've continued to explore the world of OERs, but that's how I got started. And so maybe other experiences will come up with questions later. What kind of student feedback have you gotten since you made that transition? Um, it's been good. I mean, the, the student feedback is maybe a, a, a little sparse because they don't have experience using both the paper textbook and the online textbook. Uh, the way that the textbook is delivered uh, as an OER is not on paper, right? And so any sort of negative evaluations of the textbook that we've received is, I would like a paper textbook. Now, uh, you know, that said, like you, you can purchase a paper textbook if you want it that bad, right? Uh, uh, they they do, like with, with many OERs, I, I believe, uh, is it Flat World, uh, that uh, their business model is sort of to make paper versions of open educational resources. Uh, so it is possible, and I tell my students about where it's possible to get a paper copy of the textbook. Nobody does it. Uh, uh, they, they, they just put up with you know, um, uh, the, uh, the, the OER delivery, and, and it's, it's not delivered as like a massive PDF file. Uh, it's broken up into individual readings that are then uh, uh, inserted into different modules uh, on a, a course management system. Um, and so the way that they interface with the readings is very much like they would interface with an article or an essay that you ask them to read, right? It's posted online. And so they're kind of used to that format. Um, uh, in terms of the content, um, there's not been any negative feedback as far, or at least not in, in my classes. Uh, and in my opinion, I think the opinion of the other faculty in the department, it's actually a better textbook. It's better written and uh, hat is, you know, I think that the, the thing about an OER is that there are fewer restrictions that uh, for authors uh, in, in terms of page limits, uh, you know, uh, how many, you know, and what kind of pictures can be used and that sort of thing. And so like, there's just, there's more in the textbook. It puts a little bit of a burden on, on uh, teachers to uh, move through slightly more material and pick and choose what they want to use. Um, but of course, that's the nice thing about an OER is that you can cut out uh, what you're not going to use and um, uh, and only keep what you want and modify what you want in most cases, right? Um, so, you know, I guess, what has the student feedback been? Uh, sparse, but generally positive. Um, I think students do like paper. Um, you know, for me, it's a little bit like the, uh, uh, um, the, the preference for vinyl you know, albums or something, right? Like, that, that, yes, I, I understand that there's like a romantic dimension to it, you know, and, and paper is nice aesthetically uh, in some ways, but in the end, uh, the distinction is rather minor for me, right? Um, so, yeah. 
I think we'll get over it. Paper's a dead medium. We're getting rid of paper, you know. I don't have anything risky to say. <laughs> the library, I know. Because we're on the DVD floor. So. <laughs> Sure. Um, I guess in thinking about it, I don't know if I've ever really directly asked my students about whether or not they see a difference between the two. I definitely in the beginning got the feedback about um, it would have been nice to have something paper. Um, I think it depended on, you know, the type of student and, and maybe um, what they were used to. Uh, I have seen because I use an OpenStax college algebra textbook, which does come with um, a way to purchase it. And I've seen, I have seen it because some people have purchased it and it doesn't look good as a textbook. And then they complain about it as a textbook. And then I'm like, well, look at it online. <laughs> All right. Cause then online it has the capability of like, when it's a, you try problem, it doesn't give them the answer. They can try it and it's more interactive. And I think that experience um, in our day and age is, is nice and, and what they're looking for. Um, but really, I guess I haven't had I haven't had negative feedback, but I haven't necessarily had feedback directly because, again, I don't know if they fully are aware of when the OER is being used and, and when it's not. I, I, it's there that they could see it, but I don't know if they're they're thinking about it personally. Uh, I guess I would, I would just say I think my feedback has been pretty similar. Students have a real disconnect between I don't want to pay for something, but I also want a physical object, which is <laughs> it's fine. I mean, that's, you know, I have those types of disconnects also. Uh, I will say, though, that I try to be open to my students for them to come up to me and say, during the course, I don't like the textbook. Mm -hmm. And I try to have that be a question about what the textbook does well and doesn't do well, and uh, sort of what they think the purpose of a textbook is in a course, like why I provide one or why I recommend one, I guess. Um, because I think in my courses, I try to decentralize the textbook so much from like what we're doing. That when they come up and say, well, I don't like the textbook for this reason, I go, but look at, you know, look at how empowered you are to even have an opinion on a textbook, right? Like, that's a good thing. Uh, and we talk about how, how they might think it, make it better or what they think would be better. And uh, I try to link them to resources that they might find helpful in those ways. Because sometimes it's, well, I want, you know, definitions this way, or I want this resource. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go here for those resources. And our textbook is money for that. Or maybe it's, I want more problems to work on. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go here for those things. Or I want more examples. Like I, there, it's hard to have a textbook that does everything well. Uh, and I try and explain to them why I use the textbook I do and what I do think it does well, and then point them to resources that do those other things well, as opposed to having them be like, this is the grail of knowledge that I need to like put into my face and try and uh, enable them to take, take their education into their own hands a little more and like search out the resources they need for specific things, as opposed to like, when the teacher's failing me, I go to the textbook, and after the textbook's failing me, I'm done. I'm, you know, I have nothing left. So I guess that's my opinion. It's my next question kind of piggybacks on that. What opportunities and challenges have you encountered while using OER? I can start. I would think that the one challenge that I have faced, um, what, before we start 2020, uh, we fall of 2020 is when we started what is our Math 097, which is a support class for both our quantitative reasoning and stats class. And there is no textbook out there that can do both and what we needed at that time. Um, so a huge challenge is learning about remixing and how, how to um, put different components together, what, what you can and cannot do. So I, I feel like, so a challenge is depending on how you're taking OERs, there's a lot of knowledge that you need. Um, to start off with, um, to make sure that you're doing it right and, and appropriately. Um, but then also in that case, just in, it was finding all of the right pieces to be able to put together to help with that course um, was another huge challenge with that piece. But it had to do with the nature of the course and that course design as well. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a struggle that I've personally had, but I would say I'm on the same co-requisite content team as Kristen. And I'd say one of the big issues we face in moving to OERs is the uh, the loss of like online homework systems. Um, because online homework systems, especially in like developmental math or low level math courses are really helpful for students to get like immediate feedback. Otherwise they tend to write solutions, turn them in and then forget about it and move on. Uh, and so the online homework system allows them to keep trying, which is helpful. Uh, I don't think it's been a big issue for me 
um, based on just like the way I run homework in my courses and assess them. But definitely for some instructors, it's a huge loss uh, to the way they teach uh, and the way they support their students. So that's like a consideration. Uh, and within the math department, we're currently in a discussion about how to try and fix that problem. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, I think there are often in if you are not the only person who is uh, teaching uh, your class, uh, there, you know, there can be problems with faculty buy-in. Um, there's a distrust, maybe, of things that are free. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think, I, I guess that could be a challenge. I'm, you know, I guess, you know, my mind is, is really more on the opportunity side of the question. Um, uh, in the you know five years, I, I guess that I've been looking at OERs, they are grow, growing so so much and so quickly, and there are so many things that I've been introduced to that I I would have likely not thought of uh, before. So, for instance, uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about now and, and working on now is approaching. Uh, course content from like an OER first perspective, by which I mean thinking of, thinking not in terms of, of using a textbook for say classes that, that uh, upper division classes that only I teach or something like that. Uh, uh, thinking of, uh, okay, I want to uh, teach this lesson. Right, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, the, whatever particular topic we're talking about. Approaching uh, uh, that not in the way that I used to, which is sort of find a reading uh, uh, that helps to uh, illustrate and draw out the key concepts and then and talk about it. But uh, uh, you know, maybe getting away from the do a reading, have a discussion model uh, to producing. A, uh, a a multimedia um, curated and annotated uh, online digital object, right? So something that includes it, you know, looks like a web page. There, I, I I was just trying to think uh, of the name of the specific website that I'm using, uh, and I, it's for whatever reason like out of my head right now. Um, but there are a whole bunch of them out there. That allow you to very easily sort of you know drag and drop build web pages pretty simply, and and inside of that you can do things like include video clips and audio clips and uh, short excerpts from uh, from readings, and also annotate all of that uh, uh, with your own writing, right? And and so there's like a, a, you know you can produce these sort of more robust digital objects that aren't you know aren't just texts right like and, and so uh, i'm trying to think of how to leverage the the full potential of oers to make something that's way more engaging than a textbook right something that uh, uh you know people interact with differently and maybe in a non-linear way where you can kind of jump around from little objects to little objects Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's a ton of opportunity to think creatively about uh, pedagogical strategies with OERs, like stuff that I would not have thought of before had I not been thinking in the framework of OERs. Um, uh, so that's that's been the greatest opportunity for me is just sort of getting me to think harder about teaching. Yes. I, I have a question. Is what you're talking about remixing? Uh, basically, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think, but not. I, I guess when I think of remix, I think well, you're starting initially with a with an OER or a fully formed object, and then altering it in some way, right? Whereas I'm thinking of building OERs from the ground up um, using Creative Commons licensed other objects. Well, that was sort of my question, like trying to distinguish between like having even created stuff sounds like yes. And what you were just yeah, I'm in the process of it, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm in the process of designing a course that, uh, as a special topics course, will be taught in the future. Um, and more or less, you know, each uh, week has a kind of hard to describe. I wish I had a visual aid. I, like has a web page, but the you know like the uh, there is a 
some, something that looks like a module system where each module is represented by a picture and you click on the picture of that module and then you go inside of it. And then it kind of unfolds like a web page. If maybe if you've used like Adobe Spark or, uh, or even like, you know, um, like, a, uh, it's like a Squarespace or type of Wix thing, like a simple web page building tool. You go inside of there and that's what it kind of looks like. It's a mix of audio and video and writing and, uh, and you're sort of led through uh, the weekly materials uh, by the web page, right? Um, so yeah, I guess it's like you're, you know, you're mixing things for sure. Um, so I guess it is remixing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I guess I don't necessarily know if I know that in my mind, I think I know what remixing is, but I would say what I'm doing is remixing. A lot of it, I'm taking the, I'm starting with the OERs that I like. Um, I, a lot of the time I'm converting them into the Canvas page itself um, and using parts of the OER that I like, editing if there's something that either needs a little bit more or I didn't think was right. Um, adding videos along. So sometimes if they had an example and I thought, oh, it might be better if there's a video example there rather than a written. Um, I try to mix it up between written and video examples along the way. I try to um, incorporate applets that allow them to write in, in the OER uh, as the you try. Um, an applet that right in the Canvas page allows randomization so that they can try the problem over and over again. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I've done various remixing and a lot of it I'm trying to do right within the canvas page so that they don't have to go anywhere else. Um, I put PowerPoints in, you know, there's a lot of different things you can embed right within the flow of the OER, but I feel like I use the OER as a start and then think about, can that information be presented in a different way, whether it's a graphic video or whatever. And then I start changing it around within that canvas page. So, so you're really integrating it well into Canvas. It's not like on your overview page, you send them a link and say, go read section two in this random textbook online. Like it's really kind of built in. Yeah, I try, um, I try very hard to make it as built in as I possibly can so that they're not just thinking that they're going to this other resource and learning from it. Mm -hmm. uh, they can feel that, hopefully they feel that there have, was time and thought that was put into that page. Um, and trying to think of that page as more of, especially in an online class, that's my opportunity for lecture, right? And and what does look, lecture look like in an online page? What impact have OERs had on students, whether inside or outside the classroom, that you have observed? I think they enjoy not having to buy textbooks. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, I think that the, the best thing that we can hope for is uh, little impact, right? Like, <laughs> in other words, uh, I mean, I, you know, a positive impact would be great, but in, in terms of using a different kind of learning resource, not creating um, any sort of uh, hiccups in uh, access, uh, in, in their ability to, you know, to use it in a, in a kind of seamless and easy manner. Uh, um, and so, you know, one of the most satisfying things about the adoption of the textbook for uh, COM 110 is that, like, there really haven't been any hiccups, right? Like, that, that most people have been able, and every, I think every teacher, like, uh, uh, is is using the original resource in a different way, right? Like, I, I integrated into Canvas module, so in the weekly module, the reading for that week is in there as a separate uh, PDF or, or whatever. Uh, uh, I don't think everybody does it that way, um, uh, but also it, I haven't heard anybody having of having any problems with students accessing things or uh, or being able to use them, right? Um, and so that's been good. I feel like that's a tough question. So each question you've asked, kind of like this, I'm like, that's maybe a question that I should be putting on an eval to <laughs> <laughs> figure out. Um, what their what their thought is, and especially maybe here at midterm, um, 
again, I think no, I haven't heard any major complaints. So I feel like at, at least it has to be going really well that there's nothing like major that it's um, extremely different than if they had a textbook. Um, I, I would think that I know one thing within my online classes, I think how it's set up, it improves engagement within the online course, just because it's there and there's more opportunities to maybe interact with the course material. But then again, there's still some students that I think only look at the to-do list and don't look at all the things that I've created for them at the same time. They only go and do the things that they um, think that they need to do. Um, but then it, it also gives me the opportunity to always point them back to it when they have questions. Um, did you look at this or, or what have you? But um, no, I think these are, I haven't thought a whole lot about some of these questions, but I, my initial thought is I should be maybe asking them. So I know a little bit more of their perspective. Um, yeah, again, I think I just try to look at, so I guess I've used some OERs that I would say were not good. Like they were, and I mean, I don't know exactly how that metric works, um, but they maybe didn't do things exactly the way I would have or had problems that were a little weird or something like that. But I try to look at those faults as really uh, more of an opportunity to, to work with students to identify them. Uh, when students have a problem with the textbook, I try to interact with them and help them understand that's a, that's a good thing. They have some authority on the subject and they can identify what they consider to be faults. Uh, so my hope is that moving to OERs, at least in my classes, has really changed the the model of how I teach students from, here's a, a tome of knowledge that I'm handing to you, to we are cooperating to try and build your knowledge based on the resource we have. Uh, and so I think at the very least, it just breaks down the, the like provider receiver concept of education into a collaborative uh, process. So I think it's done a good job of that. I don't necessarily think students love that <laughs> or like, or see the value in it all the time, but I think overall they, they do eventually. It might just take a few years. Um, I, I would say when I was requiring students to buy books, which was mostly before I came to WS, I think from here, most of my courses have been with free resources or open resources. Uh, I felt really required to, to like use that resource and get them to use it. So I had to assign problems out of it. I had to like point to sections and results in it. Uh, and I really like that I, that I feel a little more free now to be like, well, you know, the book does this this way. And I think that's a little weird, but it was free. You know, you didn't have to buy it. And like, we can talk about its deficiency in this way. Uh, so I feel much more enabled to like, maybe not craft the material because it's math. It's, it is what it is, but to craft their experience around it uh, and the experience they're having in class. So yeah, I definitely feel like it makes me more excited to teach, not feeling like I have to follow a textbook because I made them spend $200 on it and now I have to do what it says. You know, I, I wanna be in charge of my own classes, not the textbook. Yeah, and I guess I would kind of just piggy off that. I, I agree in the sense, especially in the online world, um, being able to have more control with the OER makes me feel more like an active teacher, um, kind of like I'm in the classroom, where if I was relying more on the um, the textbook or even like uh, the online homework systems and, and the online homework systems have a lot. They have videos built in some, you know, they have videos, they have examples and, and the online homework. I, I just don't want my student feeling that those sources are doing the teaching where I feel like this puts it a little bit more in my hands. And I know um, I've developed something that I'm very proud of um, and just feel like, I don't know, a bigger contribution of me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll go back to what I said before, which is probably a little bit garbled. garbled. Uh, um, I, in, uh, in, in communication, for instance, uh, the way that I think most people approach course design or have in the past is, okay, I want to I want to cover uh, a topic, let's say gender and communication. And so I have a few options. One, I can choose a textbook that sort of maps out the trajectory of the semester for me. Uh, two, I can build my own syllabus uh, using readings and, and maybe using some films from the library or something like this. Uh, but the really exciting thing about OER is, is that when you sit down uh, to design a course with uh, the idea that what I'm going to be doing is creating a sort of curated and annotated 
collection of digital objects right, <laughs> that help us work through this uh, this uh, topic. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many possibilities, and and uh, and and it's such an you know there there is so, such room for creativity that I that might have been there in part in the past, right? But it, but with the um, just the fact of digital convergence, the fact that uh, that readings and audio and video, and maybe I want to put myself talking, or maybe and do a little lecture, or do you know whatever. All of those can be in one place. They can all be translated into a single uh, medium, the web page, right? Like, and uh, uh, and so you begin thinking about what a class is very differently, right? That it's uh, um, it's not limited to uh, reading and then discussion or uh, but we're doing you know, all kinds of things, and then you can think about well, how can students participate uh, in a more active way in uh, with this digital object? And you know, we're having discussions around you know the uh, the various elements of the uh, the OER, uh, whether it's on campus or somewhere else. And um, and so I you know like that to, yeah to me like yeah I feel much more excited and enthusiastic and, and involved in uh, uh, in course development. Which is, you know, I'm only really doing for the first time uh, you know, this year um, when it comes to OERs. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really cool opportunity. One criticism of OER is that it's time consuming and difficult to, uh, to create. What kinds of advice or what was your experience with getting started with OERs and a lack of support or perceived lack of support? How were you? Yeah. How were you all? How I? <laughs> I mean, I think, like, also, like I said earlier, uh, the world's changing, right? Like, <laughs> it's, each, each year it becomes less time consuming and less difficult. Because there are so many people who are engaging with OERs and trying to create them, um, right? there's just a lot more content out there, right? And it's it's growing exponentially. Uh, so, not to use a math word that I probably don't understand, but uh, I think I think I think you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I mean, and also I mean, not only that, but like the digital production tools are becoming so much more user friendly. Like you don't. I mean, you know, we all have phones, right? Like you can make pretty sophisticated videos and images uh, on your phone, right? Like that it's not hard anymore uh, to to do a lot of this stuff. It's, it's like some stuff is, is still difficult, right? But it's becoming less difficult. And so I don't think that, you know, I don't think that that should, should scare you off. And, um, you know, our time is already, you know, we're already overburdened. <laughs> you know, various other things. Like, so, yeah. It, you know. I guess I would say I don't have a lot of experience like making OERs. I'm on like a small task force in our department to remake our calculus text, which is moving very slowly. <laughs> uh, but I guess my opinion is if you just if you just think the, of the product of designing an OER as the OER itself, yeah, it's probably like really time consuming and uh, really difficult in terms of that. But if you think of the product as a, a really deep reflection on how your material should be presented, how you should engage with your students, how you should assess your students. Uh, and what their needs are, then the payoff is really massive. Um, the whole process can be enlightening and, and you get a much bigger payoff for your time if you don't just think of, I put in 100 hours and I got eight pages of material. But if you think I put in 100 hours and it's really changed the way I interact with this, the way I interact with my students and the experience I provide them, then that's 100 hours well spent. I guess is my opinion. Yeah, and I guess I would just say it's not something that you have to jump head first into. Um, I feel like even though I started using an OER probably five years ago in a class, it my, it's just grown since. Um, I've tried something new every year, so it's developing. Um, so I guess, yes, it's, it's developed over a lot of years, but it's not something that I just had to sit down and do all at once. Um, I can continuously make it better, and that's kind of the nature of OERs anyway, right? They're open for people to look at, to edit, to modify. Um, and I feel like that's just a process. And if you're if you're teaching, in my mind, that's something you're doing anyway. Um, and you're trying to adapt and make things better. And um, it's just now I have the 
control of doing that with the resource rather than just always having to maybe deal with the same problem in a text that I had to purchase for the class and having to deal with it every single time I can now fix it and move on past it um, and maybe figure out I have to fix something else, but that's okay. Um, so that's I would just point. look at it as that continuous process. If you're using a textbook, you're just stuck with the deficits, right? Correct. So now the yeah, other, yeah. You, can, you can do what you want. So this is an interesting, um, I'm the one person in the department that is really holding on to some of the older stuff. <laughs> and and there, so this is really helpful for me to be here, but um, two questions are more philosophical. Is one, I will struggle with copyright because I feel like um, a couple of things I want to give do, but um, but it's just like in Spotify, you you get to listen to music for free if you don't subscribe, but you have to listen to commercials. And I feel like the example of I, I like your example of the textbook the communication, and I don't think it's coincidental that the OER kind of follows the. No, it's not. So, so I follow the one that's best selling, and I kind of think someone went through all that work, you know, and they, and, and in a way, I don't know if it's true, but when there's, it seems like if something's published, that maybe has been vetted more. And in math, for instance, like the definition can be off just a teeny bit and it's incorrect. And I don't always trust myself to always see all those nuances. So when I see something published, and I feel like it's gone through um, some sort of process, you know, and they, I can feel more comfortable, like, it's more likely that I'm wrong than that, you know, like if I see that definition, <laughs> but I'm afraid something can get by me, and I, um, when in this kind of wiki age where someone can just make an edit, and then all of a sudden that's the truth, and maybe it's not, you know, and so I kind of, I struggle with both of those things, like feeling like I, I owe to, like, some sort of respect to the artist that created the initial product, like in a song, like I'm listening to this, I know I should pay for it in some way. And and, and that just might be an old mentality. And then also um, wondering how trustworthy, because anyone can put something out there and and feeling like for me, one of, one of the hardest things when I'm teaching, when I first started out especially was making sure that when I gave an answer that I really looked at the whys behind and that I had every little hole Covered. So when I said that's always true in a math situation, that I was, it was right, you know. And I, and I, I feel like I lose some of that if I am using a, a resource that maybe haven't gone through some of those channels. So those are just some of my open thoughts. I don't. Know. I think. I mean, that's a that's a great set of concerns uh, that are really important. Uh, and I think you're right. Like that, one of the major issues around open educational resources is uh, the reliability. What I would say in response is that I believe that a collective intelligence uh, uh, that uh, it, it very much like Wikipedia that is uh, able to constantly edit uh, a resource is more likely to spot mistakes than uh, a, a single you know, publisher. Uh, for instance, I'm using a textbook this semester uh, uh, called uh, Persuasion in the Media Age. And I'm not going to call out the textbook author. <laughs> like, I mean, I, you know, like in chapter one, like with the first week of class, and we're, we're reading about, you know, the, uh, the, you know the, the long history of the development of language um, in the human species. And, uh, and th this textbook that uh, I had used for several years and it's never stood out to me before. It said that uh, human beings uh, uh, only started speaking to one another in words around 10,000 years ago, uh, which a moment's reflection would tell you is absolutely untrue uh, and not even close to true, right? Like it just, it's not, it's the nonsensical right thing. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, maybe math is different. I'm sure it is like that there, there maybe that, that there has to be some, you know, very precise vetting of certain you know, uh, definitions or, or whatever, but like, there are there are mistakes and inaccuracies in textbooks all of the time, and I would be more inclined to believe that a large number of people, and this relies on wide adapt, uh, adoption of the OER, but a large number of people having eyes on it uh, is going to be more likely to spot errors than. Um, however many people 
uh, work on the uh, editing and proofreading in a publishing house. <laughs> like, um, so, I, you know, one, I wouldn't expect that uh, that traditional means of vetting are necessarily superior. They might be in this interim period before a, an OER gets wide adoption and has a lot of eyes on it. Uh, secondly, um, the second objection, I think, is more philosophical, uh, which uh, should people who wrote textbooks uh, be um, compensated for uh, what, what they wrote? And, you know, that's a difficult question. Uh, I think information should be free. <laughs> but um, if you wrote a textbook, good for you. Uh, I'm sure you got paid for it, um, but you don't need that anymore. Right, uh, and uh, that if that economic model is exploitative and unfair uh, and gouging students every way that it can at every turn, uh, then I don't feel bad about undermining it. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I'm philosophically on the other side of the publishing house, but <laughs> like that, uh, um, uh, I don't think that access to learning should be uh, uh, have a, a, a moat that you have to build a money bridge across to, to get to right like uh, um, so that, that's what I would say right um, you know and this text, you know, like, at least the one that I replaced you know this this textbook has been uh, making this person you know Julia T Wood I mean she has uh, <laughs> she has 15 textbooks that are like the most popular you know all across the field she's Millions of dollars are. She's fine. She's not <laughs> um, I think. I think I can reflect on this a little bit, coming specifically from the math department, also, and having an uh, opinion. And then again, I'll preface this: this is very much my opinion uh, and how I sort of think about things. In terms of uh, like inaccuracies or like uh, things that might be wrong in textbooks, I guess like to me. The, the, the worry about that, which I think is very common, uh, comes from this idea that a student is going to see something in the textbook, it's going to be wrong, and it's going to persist in their brain, and they're going to make a mistake later in life. I would imagine that the number of students who see something and remember it exactly as the way it is, long enough to then use it in a like dire circumstances, is basically zero. I just don't think that that happens. Um, I mean, I... I think we have this again, and I think it comes from this idea of like what we're doing is giving students information uh, and we're responsible for making sure that information is perfect. Uh, and while I think that there's some truth to that, and certainly I don't want to be up there telling my students false things, uh, really I think of my role more as teaching students how to acquire and vet information and then use it to solve problems. Um, and so while so if I have a textbook that has something wrong in it, if it's exposed, that's great, because then we can have a discussion about why it's wrong. Uh, and if it's not, ideally, the way I think about it is that if that def if that information that was wrong got into their brain, it should be ex simply exposed to me through assessment. And so I think of my job as being largely the assessment component where I'm checking the knowledge that they have and telling them, no, uh, where, like, where did you get this? Oh, it's in the book. Let's talk about why that's wrong. So ideally, all the important things that I deem important should be should be vetted through me through the assessment process. Um, so I don't like really think that that's for me. It's not a huge issue because I just don't think that the percentage of students who go on with like the wrong definition of standard deviation and like remember it exactly from the book and then use it to you know treat someone medically. I just think it's probably zero. Um, <laughs> As far as money, I also think, like, so in math especially, like calculus, statistics, they're the heart of courses that we teach at university. That knowledge is centuries old. Mm -hmm. uh, and what your what textbook producers are doing, who sell them, they're presenting it, they're organizing it, which is great. I would imagine that there's almost no one who's presented like a popular textbook whose wallet is hurting because of an OER. So Stewart is the calculus example. Stewart gets updated every two years, and then universities force students to buy a new version. Calculus has not changed in a long <laughs> time. Uh, and like realistically, besides online homework, which I'm 100% on board with, you can ask students to pay for that because it's so enriching. Uh, if you can divorce it from the wild cost of a textbook, I'm all for it. It's a great use of student resource. Um, they're not adding anything meaningful in editions 7, 8, 9, 10, 
two years after the previous one. It's just a way to, to force students to buy new ones. Uh, and so I'm, I'm with Chad. I will wage against the publishing industries what I consider predatory tactics any way I can. Uh, and also, you know, I also, to some extent, just kind of have to trust the copyright laws that if a, if a publisher basically, or if a person takes Stuart and like basically rewrites it word for word and lists it as an OER, <laughs> those publishers, whoever publishes Stuart, uh, McGraw-Hill, they're, they're going to go after them. McGraw-Hill has lots of lawyers. They're going to attack them. So I don't worry too much about that. And I don't uh, concern myself too much. Uh, it could be a problem, but I don't know. Oh, I mean, I also use a lot of the textbooks I use are shared by the authors and they're like, mm -hmm. they're novel. They're very specific. They wrote them for courses. A lot of them grow out of lecture notes. So that's my and experience. Another thing I, well, one of the other things that keeps me sometimes is the work that the author put into update material that like statistics examples a lot of the one book i like to use all the examples are not imaginary they're actual okay this website and this research says that 90 percent of people do this let's look at that now in this problem and i i do write my own problem based on current research from my labs and it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. so to do that for every homework question i think is valuable but i i, I think it would be hard for me to pull away from that in that course because i think students need to see it's relevant and it's this information is real. It's not just a made up, like some of the problems in the class we have, they say a mayor of Happyville or whatever, they just make up and it's like, I'm already just interested in the problem. I know <laughs> yeah. This is completely silly. But if you told me the actual results from LA or whatever and, and, and give me the, the numbers and more inclined, inclined. So I think that that's another thing that's hard with OER is staying up to date with like a calculus book, right? That's different. It, the, the information is old. and. The rules are old and, and stats the same thing, except that the examples that are applied being updated, I think, really brings value to the students. Mm -hmm. So it's like a catch for me there, too. Sure. So anyways. <laughs> it, would be, it would be really cool if, you know, you could imagine a situation in which there was something like a Wikipedia of stats problems, right, mm -hmm. where people who teach the classes are able to sort of enter their uh, excellent examples, right? And, and that's sort of like, that's something you can do with OERs that makes it more current and more relevant than, mm -hmm. let's say, a textbook and that doesn't exist yet yeah. in most places. There's a comm theory one that has like a wiki type version of uh, communication theory um, textbook that's in a, in a nascent stage. Um, I think people are thinking along those lines of like, how do we make OERs more collaborative across universities? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's really exciting. It seems like something that you know, within the next five to 10 years of the in the future. Well, it is 12.52 and it flew by. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and I want to thank our panelists for this enlightening discussion. Remember, this was streamed via YouTube Live, um, technology issues notwithstanding. So we'll send out an updated link later on if you would like to watch this again or forward it to your friends. Well, look at those metrics. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank yeah, you. thank you, everybody. It's like that one commercial that goes, you'll get tens of tens of.